Hello and welcome back to Vampire the Masquerade Chapters. Tonight we are playing Hakata Prologue Chapter 1, Carnival. Uh, we will also be playing as Aurora Rosalini of Clan Hakata. We will real quickly go over her story real quick here. In Cora Tranoi, Circus of Vanishing Children, Winter of the Faceless, only the most devout horror film enthusiasts still talk about these obscure cult classics. And to know any of these titles is to also know Aurora Rosalini, the lead actress and often tragic protagonist. Born in Montefalco, Aurora has been pushed in front of cameras from a very young age. Her pale complexion, strangely calm voice, and mature demeanor charmed audiences and made her the perfect for the ever-popular Giallo films. Horror thrillers that became part of her brand when she caught the eye of Hollywood producers and they brought her into the limelight. The strangely eerie aura that accompanied Aurora worked well for the newly crowned sweet Scream Queen, and there is no doubt she would have ascended to stardom if not for the strange misfortunes that seemed to befall the production she was associated with. Fires, unexplained disappearances, baffling distortions of an otherwise perfect shot. While shooting, they always watch, the male lead suddenly starts speaking in tongues and his body bent in unnatural ways as he started killing the crew one by one. The movie was never released, of course, but should someone watch the last scene filmed, they would see a mortally wounded Aurora gasping for help and a tall, gaunt woman snapping the neck of the frenzied actor before whisking her out of frame and out of the limelight forever. Although national newspapers claimed otherwise, Aurora's story did not end that night. Spared a painful death, she, only, she felt only undying gratitude and love for Charlotte Milliner, her savior. For years, she learned of the kindred, the Hakata, the strange phenomenon, the phenomenons that plagued her all her life, to no longer be victim to them and instead bend them to her will. When she moved with her sire to New Orleans, they found the vengeful spirit called the Surgeon, who had possessed her co-star, was well intent on finishing the job and making Aurora's last scream his to enjoy. Um, Aurora has two physical giving us four health uh two social and three mental giving us five willpower uh, she has athletics one stealth one persuasion two insight one subterfuge two intimidation two search one awareness one and occult three as well as oblivion necromancy one death sight and fortitude one resilience she does start with five humanity which means our hunger will start off at two. But we get a plus one die to our intimidation checks. Um, she also has the Hakata Curse Painful Kiss. When feeding on an NPC during a chapter, roll a red die. If you roll a skull, you lose one humanity. So that can go pretty bad pretty quick. But I don't think we have any NPCs we can feed on in this round, so there's at least that much. Um, right now, we have got item-wise, my dear lockpicking set, smart glasses to give us one die for technology, night vision goggles to give us another awareness, and the old boots to give us plus one movement, so that we have three movement as opposed to two. Um, she only has basic attack abilities. Um, she has no, like, weapon skills or anything. So, uh, any errata that we've got here that I need to be aware of before we start? The errata list was last updated October 2nd, 2023. One. During event four, add the instruction and read event six at the end of the second option if you have fortitude. Got it. Okay. So nothing too much there. The Carnival. Mardi Gras, New Orleans, Louisiana. The smell of sweat, sex, spices, seafood, booze, and vomit are paired with the, the acridity of the primordial swamp lurking just inches under the aged concrete. Somewhere deeper into the city, the crusting cheers of a massive crowd can be heard. Echoes of distant fireworks periodically reach your ears as music floods the city. 
The carnival and the colorful crews came and went behind the heavy curtains of your temporary haven. The chaotic parade left the streets littered with trash of green, purple, and gold. You step out of your room and onto the balcony overlooking the wake of the festival. Leaning on the thin iron rot railing is Charlotte Milliner's slender form. She barely turns her head toward you, her lips curling into a slight smile. You place your hands on the small of her back and join her. Any traces of it, you ask tentatively as your sire's gaze darkens. She stays quiet, letting the wind tousle her hair. No, she replies after a time, her tone measured and flat. I'd let you know if there was any hands. It's been five days already. I'm sure it's here in this city somewhere. Your sire turns fully towards you, an impish look on her otherwise serious features. I think we deserve a break. I'd hate to think I'd deprive you of such a night, Charlotte smirks. You shake your head. It's been a long time since I've cared for parties. I'd rather find out where the surgeon is, and Charlotte interrupts you mid sentence. We've tried for the past week. It's laying low, Aurora. It doesn't want to be found, and working ourselves raw won't get us to it any quicker. She says, kissing you deeply. You reciprocate, ignoring the wolf whistles coming from the streets. We should get something to eat. Enjoy ourselves a little, she whispers in your ear. Perfect night for it, too. Plenty of idiots walking around unaware of, well, everything. She says, dragging you down the spiral staircase towards the street. Get us something good, won't you? She grins at you as you both step onto the sidewalk. It's true you've neglected your hunger for some time, too, secure, too focused on your research. You survey the streets before you. The late hour has reduced triumphant thunder of the celebration to a dull roar. A few drunken tourists, exhausted and late-night partiers, stragglers, and workers seem to be all that remains. Grab yourself and your sire someone good to eat. Action read event one. We have dialogue NPCs, uh, five of them as well as three regular NPCs. So, event one. R and R. For the first night in some time, you step into the streets with the sole purpose to decompress. After a week of strange, profane rituals meant to test the shroud for any anomalies and traces of the specter, Charlotte was right. The single night spent soaking in the ambiance of the carnival shouldn't be detrimental to your larger goal. After all, the excited masses drawn to this event should make testing the veil tonight quite futile. The unbridled emotions would heavily scramble any inconsistencies you could detect. You shake your head. You shouldn't be thinking about work. There's plenty of dazed and unwary kind walking the streets right in front of your hotel room. And it's true that you've been a bit peckish. Scanning the area for suitable prey, you set out to find a good meal. This could be fun. Increase your hunger by one. So, okay, so we're actually going to start at three. Resume playing. Okay, so... Charlotte is right here, and we can talk to her... So let's see if she's got anything to say before we head out. Charlotte Milner Dialogue, page 5. Leaning against a full marble pillar in front of the apartment that served as your temporary haven these past few nights, Charlotte scans the streets meticulously. In the wake of the carnival, the sole remains of the festivities of trash, human or otherwise. Whatever few revelers remaining are scattered running a party high this since past. Charlotte turns as you approach, gracing you with an unfeigned smile. If you have clue token number three, you must read dialogue three. If you have two investigation success tokens, read D2. Otherwise, you steal a furtive kiss from your sire and turn your attention back to the streets. Resume playing. So I guess we're resume playing. Um, okay. So, we got three hunger dice to start. I'm just going to have those right there. We've got three movements, so we're going to go one, two, three. We're going to head towards that action token, and then one. Action token one, page 49. Fisticuffs. Two men are fighting, and they seem to have been for quite some time. Based on how exhausted they both seem to be, you probably showed up quite a bit after the start of their altercation. However, despite their fatigue, they seem to only stop to take their breath for a moment before throwing themselves again at each other, exchanging a few blows before breaking apart and repeating the cycle again. To make a social plus insight check, difficulty three. So we've got one automatic success and 
We would tip typically have two dice to throw, but because of our hunger, we have three dice. So we need two successes here for this. That's three more successes, so four total. Read E3. Empty hatred. There's something empty, mechanical even, to their aggression. You observe them with clinical detachment as they attempt to hurt one another with whatever shred of strength they have left. Such detached violence is beautiful in its own way. Furthermore, one of them might end up at the morgue, which is always a quick and easy meal for you and your sire. Take one investigation success token. You're unable to feel any empathy for the men, but they seem tired and weak, and separating them might break the cycle in which they seem to be stuck. You can, motivated by curiosity, attempt to break up the fight, make a physical plus brawl check, difficulty two, which we have no brawl. If you have fortitude level one, you can call upon your supernatural resilience to break them up by reading E6. Or if you have no reason to break them apart, you walk away, remove action token from the tile. Well, we do have fortitude, so let's go ahead. Yeah, let's go to E6. Quite an unstoppable force. Expending part of your Vita, you walk confidently between the two men. Make a rouse check. We succeed. Incapable of reaching one another while you stand there, their frustration only grows until they mindlessly throw punches straight at you and then attempt to knock you out of their way. You hear the sound of phalanges breaking against your skull. Two men fall to the ground, whimpering and holding their wrecked hands. You look down at them, sneering as you wipe away some of your smeared lipstick. Go back home, you're both ridiculous. Listen here, you fucking bitch, one of the men slurs as he attempts to stand up. Grabbing him by the hair, you slam his head back onto the pavement as he whines in agony. As I was saying, you continue calmly, you're going to go home. Next time I see you act like primates, I can guarantee you it's going to be the last. Capiche? Whimpering, the two men run away from the scene. The rare witnesses that seem clap and whistle and cheer at the bravery you showed. Discarding your shoes, you leave without a second glance behind. Take the vigorous effect card and remove action token one from the tile. So we got that. And vigorous. Is this one. Feel the rush. Plus two dice to your next physical check. Okay, nice. Those just spilled. We're just gonna put that over vampires out. I'm pretty sure there's supposed to be something for us to get rid of Vampire's Oath earlier, but uh, I don't know. Okay, resume playing. So, these guys both have dialogue. And these guys both have dialogue. He doesn't have dialogue, but he's by the investigation. We do have one stealth. So we need, we need two successes for a stealth check there.
Okay, so we are going to stealth, which I need a stealth token. So we are stealthed. And we are going to go one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. Okay, so we have to make a stealth check. We need two successes. Okay, so we had one, we've got three total, so we are able to get there without being detected, and we are going to look at investigation number one, page 41. Music band. A group of musicians dressed in the colors of Mardi Gras play some soulful, upbeat tune you've never heard before. The crowd around them makes some makes them unlikely prey for tonight's meal. Oh, wait, that was a physical check, so I guess I had... I would add two extra dice for that, too. Yeah, what the hell. So, five successes, or four successes. Anyway, there goes Vigorous. Crowd around them makes them unlikely prey for tonight's meal. Some words root your ears even as you approach them. Eyes of wax and hands of blades. He's gonna get you if you ain't got the faith. He ain't the devil child, no. Even though he might be in your heart, he ain't the devil child, no, no. But he wants you all the same. Make a mental plus awareness check. Zero to two successes, re in one. Three plus successes, re in two. So we've got one success for awareness and we get one extra die from our night vision goggles. We need how many successes? Three? We need two more successes. One, two, three. So that gives us four total. Read I in two. You notice musicians, despite their white smiles, seem at the end of their rope. Red and bloody fingers continue to play their instruments without skipping a beat. Cracked and parched lips behind their wide sunglasses, the source of the trail of tears stain their cheeks. They continue to play and sing regardless of their injuries without showing any acknowledgement of them. There ain't nothing you can do, not Marie Laveau, not the Queen of Voodoo, could stop his icy clutches, oh. Take one investigation success token. No one around seems to know a strange state the band seems to be locked in. You turn around and leave them to their fate, going through the breadth of your occult knowledge, attempting to figure out who or what could cause such a state of morals. Remove investigation area token one from the tile. And resume playing. So we lose our stealth. Okay. So I feel like... Charlotte and Aurora are kind of amorous. So I feel like these two, which are the, I believe, uh, the indecent lovers, or the indecent couple, might be a good potential meal. So one, two, three, one, two, three, and one. Indecent couple, page 37. Naughty enough to save Santa a trip. You approach the couple, hoping to evaluate how suitable they'd be for an evening drink. It's been a rare occurrence for you to manage to lure two people at once back to your haven, but you're willing to consider it nonetheless. Dressed up in festive purple, green, and gold, the middle-aged couple is fondling and kissing each other like teenagers, oblivious to the gaze of onlookers. The passion which they go at one another seems to only grow bolder with every minute. You have clue token number two, which we don't. You must read D3. <clears throat> 
You can observe them closer by reading D2 or leave them be before this degenerates into something you don't want to see, in which case they can no longer be interacted with. Okay, let's read D2. Eros and Thanatos. The way you look at them, the more you look at them, the more you realize that something is wrong. There's a certain de distress, desperation in the way they kiss, fondle, and hug. They kiss so violently they barely take time to breathe. Their faces red, gasping the brief moments where their lips aren't locked together. They grasp at each other without love or care. It looks almost like they're wrestling as much as lusting for one another. It's been a long time since you haven't felt anything so passionate and human, and it's hard for you to relate in any way, but you're pretty certain this is not how love is expressed normally. It simply seems like excess of passion to the point of helpless desperation. Take one investigation success token. We're getting a lot of those. There's nothing much you can feel you can or wish to do for the couple. They're suspicious yet pure out of display of affection makes you feel detached and aloof by comparison. With a heartache you can't truly identify, you walk away quickly trying to put their distressing display out of your mind. Be a decent couple can no longer be interacted with. Resume playing. Well, damn. Um, I guess we're going after this guard. One, two... Police officer, page 11. Blessed are the peacekeepers. The officer is standing tall on the edge of the sidewalk, whimsically swinging his nightstick as he scans the streets with a wide, carefree grin. As he sees you approach, his eyes turn in your general direction without fully looking at you. You have clue token number two. I would really like to know where clue token number two is. You must read D2. You have two plus investigation tokens, just strange events you've seen tonight, otherwise um, D3, otherwise read D4. So we do have three success investigation tokens. Let's see, D3. The man is acting strangely, and you've seen stranger plenty tonight. After careful examination, you realize he's not simply swinging the nightstick around, but rather moving it in a manner not unlike a conductor with his baton, to a tune only he can hear. When others seem deeply troubled and fervent to the point of despair, he seems almost calm. Being close to him feels like standing in the eye of the storm. If you have clue token number three, we don't. Uh, you've done your due diligence and learned what you could. Perhaps your side would be willing to help further. Otherwise, you're certain something unnatural is happening, but unnatural could have a staggering amount of causes. You have oblivion plus necromancy. You attempt to peer at the world beyond the veil, trying to see if your feelings are founded. Read D5. Otherwise, unwilling to draw attention to yourself so close to the man, you instead choose to relay the info to your sire. Um, he doesn't get removed from the field if we do that, so we are going to resume playing and move away from him. One, two, three. One, two, three. Let's see. Ah, now. One, two, three. Let's see if we can feed on this guy. If we can get this guy. Um, so this is Shivering Man, page 25. Said no to drugs, but they didn't listen. Scratching his forearms and throwing nervous manic glances at every moving shadow around, the young man seems to be in some sort of paranoid delirium. Dilated pupils, shifting his weight from one leg to the other, you're certain that whatever drugs he took, he certainly isn't having a good time with him. He sees you walk in his direction, he approaches as well. Hey lady, his voice wavers as if he's going to burst into tears any moment. Do you, do you have any sunglasses to sell? You seem like you, you wear sunglasses sometimes. He slurs, seemingly unable to hold your gaze for more than a second. You smirk. Junkies like this have always been a constant background noise in any city you've lived in. Quite dangerous to feed on, unless you want to find yourself in the same state they are. You've tried to stay away from their tainted vitae. Still, the man looks at you expectantly, shifting his weight from one foot to the next excitedly. We can say yes, but I doubt you have enough money to afford them. Read D2. Okay, read, why would you need sunglasses, dear? It's night. Read D3. No, you leave him to his freak out, not seeing any value in continuing your action. Remove play and remove him from the field. Let's go for D3. Find out why he wants them. Open your eye. The black snow, the dirty black snow that stains, he says, pointing at the darkened sky. It's everywhere here. I want to leave, but I can't. Coughs and scratches his arm madly. Everything has it around him, some more than others. My hands are full of it. He says distress, showing you his perfectly empty hands, tears running down his face. There's something about the way he describes his delirium that gives you an odd sense of deja vu. 
make a mental plus a cult check difficulty two. Um, we've got three on max successes and third eye gives us a fourth success. Um, so we still have to roll even though we have four successes already. And the skull is only one feeding on a human, so uh, we got five successes total. That's more than the one skull, so we succeed. Read the four. Sleepwalking beyond the sticks. What the young man describes is certainly a nightmarish vision, but not one that's completely wrong. One of the first visions of the Shadowlands you have is one that your sire guided you through. You remember seeing the darkened streaks that tore the world behind the curtains of reality. The small tears behind the world. Small tears between the worlds could, to the uninitiated, look like strange black snowflakes ripping through the sky wherever the veil is thin. It's possible in his deeply altered state he may get glimpses of this reality without understanding what he sees. You're worried. Those tears are generally only present in the vicinity of powerful spiritual activities, knowing that neither you or your sire have enacted rituals substantial enough to create this kind of chaos. Take one investigating success token. You approach the man feeling a weak ember of something akin to empathy in you, remembering how you felt when that world was revealed to you. I know, I've seen them too. Ignore them, they'll pass. You grab him by the shoulders, forcing his gaze on yours. Keep yourself warm, get some rest, you order him. He nods meekly and slumps down the sidewalk, gathering his knees against himself, rocking back and forth, repeating, Keep warm, get some rest, ignore the dark snow. Shivering man can no longer be interacted with, resume playing. Well, we've only got one more dialogue NPC we can interact with. Um, yeah, none of those other guys are marked as feeding NPCs. So, one, two. I guess we're going for the last guy here. Blacked Out Drunk, page 31. Best time you'll never remember. The man is laying in an awkward fetal position on the sidewalk. Forgot that was there. His once fine business attire soaked with unidentifiable, unidentifiable liquid, an acrid smell floating around him. One of his eyes is swollen and purplish. Small rivulets of blood take the side of his head where it seems he hit the pavement with it. His breathing appears to be stable and regular. Make a mental plus cult check difficulty too. Well, once again, we've got three successes to start. Four, five. Success read D2. You look at the man, younger than you initially believed. Seems well-bred and dressed and blessed by genetics, even though it's hard to see that in this moment. His bottle of alcohol seems to have been drunk into such a frenzy that half of it ended up on him or on the ground. Something about all this feels off. Get the impression he must not have been a drinker before, and suddenly tonight tried to drink himself into a stupor as quickly as he could. You don't know of any peer pressure that's strong. Either he was going through something that made him want to kill himself, or he was somehow pushed into this extreme self-destructive action. Take one success token. There does seem to be a good amount of half-coagulated blood near his head wound for you to slake your thirst a bit if you want to. Nowhere near enough for a meal for both you and your sire, it should nonetheless be sufficient to keep the thirst at bay for you. Wouldn't be the freshest or best vitae you've had by far, but due to the rather terrifying effect of your kiss, you've learned to get by with what you can. Attempt to lick up the blood without drawing attention. Read D4 or leave him to his fate. We're probably going to get seen doing this, and it's going to give us a Masquerade Breach, but we haven't had one of those yet, so that's okay. We're going to go for D4. Sometimes you take the drink. You look around. The streets are still quite busy, but no one is really paying attention to you or the man. It seems solitude of crowds will work to your benefit tonight. Waiting for an opportune moment, you push the man to his side, revealing the wound, and like a leech, begin sucking at the edges of it. Cold, stale blood with small amounts of hot, fresh vitae as the wound still oozes with rare drops of crimson you lap up eagerly. Decrease your hunger by one. Boop. Read D5. We're probably going to get seen here. Sometimes drink takes you, but as you drink, another heat spreads through you. The blood alcohol level of the man is quite high, and as your hunger abates, a lightheadedness takes you. Mollified, you walk away from the unconscious kind, each step just a bit harder than the last. Take the distracted effect card, and the blackout drunk man can no longer be interacted with. Distracted.
minus one die to your next mental check. That's actually not too terrible. I can live with that. In exchange for getting our hunger down one, I can live with that. Okay, resume playing. So, one, two, three, one, two, back to Charlotte. We never found clue token number three. You have two investigation tokens, read D2. Laza, laisse, ne bon temps brule. Something's wrong tonight, you say, walking over to your sire and planting yourself at four. Not sure what it is, but people are acting strangely. Charlotte gives a passing glance at the people on the street before looking back at you. It's Mardi Gras in New Orleans. There's always a good dose of debauchery and excess going on. The flavor of the year can look a bit strange, she says, slightest hint demeaning tone to her reply. Make a mental plus persuasion check, difficulty three. So we have two persuasion and we are minus one die because of our distracted. So we need two successes right now. Oh wait, difficulty three, we need one success. We got four successes, read D5. A passion to melt dead hearts. I'm not joking, Charlotte, you say in a sense. Your sire, quite and surprised by the use of her first name instead of typical and loving sobriquet, is about to reply, but you cut her short. I've seen things that go beyond simple drugs or unrest of a holiday. We're talking passions pushed so far they turn destructive. Ecstasy to anguish and paranoia and rage. You stop to take a breath between your words. Your sire raises a hand calmly, inviting you to pause. I've been at this for some time, working for the supernatural spirits and whatever other entropic being escaped from the underworld. I might have grown a bit jaded, I won't dismiss that. Maybe I've missed a thing or two, she nods. We'll go have a look, Aurora, she replies mischievously. You've had an eye for these things before. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt, she sighs. Looks like we don't, we just don't get a night off for ourselves. You chuckle, remember, relieved by a reaction. Well, there was that night in Atlanta, remember? Charlotte rolls her eyes. I wouldn't exactly call that one uneventful cupcake, she's walkable. She says, walking alongside you. I can still feel that piece of crucifix in my lungs, she says. Wincing uncomfortably, she follows you into the streets. Take clue token number two and the third eye effect card. Charlotte can no longer be interacted with. So, clue token number two. Charlotte's off the table. We used our distracted, and we got a third eye back. All right, so... We know we want to talk to him. So one, two, three, and then one. So we approach him again. If you have clue number two, you must read D2. Unfazed by no specter. Looking at your side, you see the same unease on her as you feel when you approach the man. Simple glance between you two is all you need to communicate everything you need. Under the curious gaze of the officer, Charlotte closes her eyes, concentrating on the world beyond the veil for a moment to confirm the theory. She opens her eyes wide, not with terror, but with exultation. You've never seen her express anything this sudden or intense. That's a meat puppet. The soul of that man is gone, she snarls. Whatever or whoever is driving that body isn't supposed to be here. A spirit, a malignant one, no doubt responsible for driving everyone around them insane. So much for enjoying the carnival. You can confront it directly, walking over and address the spirit, revealing what you know. Read D6. Or, Charlotte Milner's extensive practice in tracking and dealing with spirits. Ask her if she has a ritual that may help in this situation. Let's, let's ask Charlotte first. So, D7. Unfettered. If it's not supposed to be here, how do we put it back where it's meant to be, you ask. Charlotte's gaze is locked firmly on the possessed thing, dressed like a cop. She grits her teeth. There isn't much. I'd need to know what the spirit, who the spirit was, what it cared about them. Maybe she shakes her head. Once a lifeless asshole ensconces himself in the body, getting them out is, she bites her bottom lip. Messy. So nothing. What's the point of delving into and drawing from oblivion if it doesn't allow us to deal with the things we can call? You groan annoyed. Your new life had not been without a semi-constant string of small disappointments. Charlotte's eyes grow cold. As much as she loves you in her own way, she's proud. I don't know everything, Dove. Neither do you. Not by a long shot. She gives a fleeting glance towards your temporary haven. If it's coaxed out of the body, there are things I can do. Right now, it's safe, she grins. Let's see if I can make it come out and play. Charlotte approaches the officer, smiling. This should be good. Read D11. 
Anchorless. Aren't we settling in nice? She asks the thing as she walks closer. You follow suit and stand close, ready for anything. The thing looks confused, grinning silently at her. She scoffs derisively. I mean, it's a little chubby for my taste. You could have chosen a newer model. She mirrors at the officer's body up and down. You must have been in a hurry, hmm? She leans in towards the thing with contempt. The thing chuckles. Oh, you're one who sees. Let me see you as well. Things are so blurry normally without a body. It's good to finally see what you look like, Charlotte Milliner. The thing leans closer to your sire. Its waxy smile stretched painfully wide. It smells her vivaciously as Charlotte tenses up. So righteous you feel you are, but there's not enough purpose in the world to hide how scared you are right now, my loving little dabbler. Charlotte turns towards you, her eyes wide. Get back, Aurora. Her dismay and anger playing on her normally soft features. The thing gurgles and laughs that sounds more like nails on a chalkboard. Aurora, huh? What a lovely name. He draws his firearm and levels at your head while maintaining his dagger-like stare on your sire. You always try to take away my fun, but we're the same, you and I. We're both stained blacker than the abyss, my love. You take, I take. He chides with a deranged grin. Hunting those who kill will never scrub you clean of your sins. Your past left you red and black and bubbling with rage. He smiles, pressing the firearm under his chin. And now I take one more thing away from you, he smirks. Your vengeance. The gunshot echoes through the streets. Read D12. The form of your destroyer. The screams are heard. People scramble away from the sounds of gunfire. Charlotte approaches the blank, stared, blood-stained remains of the man. Fuck, she says, moving the man's head with the tip of her boot. What was it, you ask, as you approach the empty vessel? Charlotte sighs, rubbing the bridge of her nose. The surgeon. It knew me, and only it would talk to me that way. All those days actively looking for that asshole, only to stumble upon him tonight. She spits on the corpse of the cop. He's taunting me, she whispers. Dark, smoky tendrils slender out of the man's body, and before it even fully forms, it darts away into the night sky. You both barely have time to see the impossibly thin form of the surgeon, its stretched arms ending in long and sharp fingers like scalpels. You want to go after it, you ask, ready to sprint after the spirit if needs be. Your sire gives you a tender smile. North, northeast. Sorry, love, not right now. We're going on a road trip, she says. She turns a corner and approaches her car. The black 1966 Mustang convertible glistens under the streetlights as she opens the passenger door for you. I suppose we're not going back to the room to get our stuff then, you stay as you hop in the car. Sorry about your clothes, we'll get you a new one. She smirks as the engine revs satisfyingly, and with a tire screeching against the asphalt, you peel away into the night. End of Hakata, Chapter 1. You can read the conclusion on the back of the narrative page. <clears throat> the New Orleans skyline, punctuated by infrequent fireworks illuminating the night, grows smaller in the rearview mirror as the humid Louisiana wind whips at you. Another city to add to the growing list of places you should be wary of going back to. Turn off the radio and look at Charlotte. I like that explanation now, if you don't mind. Your sire has always kept her reasons for pursuing the surgeon quite vague in the past, but after the night, you decide not to take silence as an answer, and she must have realized this from the way you look at her expectantly. Fine, she groans. I had a child or before you. Jam. Sharp as a whip and curious as well. He developed a fascination with the things coming out of the underworld. Raves, specters, and the like. I knew next to nothing about them at the time. She reaches, she reaches under her seat and pulls out a thick tone wrapped in a plastic bag that she carefully unwraps and hands to you. He took a lot of the notes about what he found. Studied ceremonies and rituals. After he met the surgeon, I, I continued them for him. She says, falling silent. You page through the tome. Notes written in impeccable handwriting start the book. Observations about things like the land beyond and denizens, as well as several ways to use the blood to control or affect them. About a third of the way through, the handwriting changes to one you recognize as Charlotte's. What happened to him, you ask? He met the surgeon. You know what happened. You saw it happen to your co-star in your last production, didn't you? You can see your hand squeeze the wheel in anger, the leather string under her grip. Same thing. Carefully, you close back the book and hand it to her, but she shakes her head. No, it's yours now, for a little while at least. She says, giving a quick look at the onboard GPS. When we get our hands on that bastard again, I'll need you ready. I need something that'll blind, bind this bastard in place, prevent it from escaping again. Think you can manage that? She asks without looking at you, her eyes firmly on the road. You look at the sometimes arcane, sometimes scientific, sometimes spiritual scribblings in the pages of the tome, unsure about what to do with them. I don't know how I'd even go about that, you whisper, pessimistic. Your sire seems unfazed. You're smart. Smarter than me. You'll figure it out. She accelerates on the darkened road. You'll figure it out, she repeats, trying to convince herself as you speed into the night. Reward. Take the old grimoire number 73 item card. You may now play Hakata Chapter 2, The Abyss Stares Back. Um, that is item card 73. That's going to be over here.
Old Grimoire, plus one die to your cult skill checks. We're just going to see those right there for the moment. All right, well, that is the end of Hakata Prologue Chapter 1, The Carnival. Uh, next time, we'll be doing Chapter 2, The Abyss Stares Back. So thank you so much for watching. I hope you're still enjoying the game. I know I sure am. And we will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.